Bhagavan, I want to attain mukti. For that you alone are my guru. I do not seek anyone else. Kindly bestow your grace on me. The attainment of mukti is not some new achievement. We are all in the form of mukti. Because we forget this, and instead wrongly think, I am this body, many thousands of thoughts arise in wave after wave and conceal what we really are. Mukti will shine only when this thought, I am the body, is destroyed. How does one get rid of this thought, I am the body? Since you have prayed to the Guru, totally surrender to him. The Guru is not in the village where I live. What can I do? The Guru is within you. Surrender to him there. What is within me is only my own self. Guru, Atma, Ishwara. These are only different names for the same thing. The essence of each is the same. After I surrender, would it be possible for me to carry on with my work? Of course, but the thought I am doing it will not arise. If the I thought is not there, how will my duties get done? Whatever you get paid for, you do with indifference. Discharge your family duties with the same indifference that you discharge your office work. The things that come and go in your office don't cause you to worry. Do all your jobs and duties with this same detachment. Difficulties keep coming to me. When will they stop? If you give up the I am the body idea, all your difficulties will fly away. I am thinking of leaving my village to go into the forest to perform tapas. I have decided to go with the permission of Sri Bhagavan. One may leave the village, but one cannot leave oneself. If the village exists apart from oneself, it may be left. To live alone at the place of self is like living in the forest. If you leave the self, even if you go and live in a forest, it will be the same as living in a city. The one who thinks that he is a sannyasin is not a sannyasin. The householder who does not think that he is a householder is a sannyasin. The one who does not think that he is the one who is doing all his actions is superior to the one who thinks that he has renounced everything. Bhagavan sometimes said, Mauna, silence, is ceaseless speech. To remain still is to work ceaselessly. This was one of several perplexing statements that Bhagavan occasionally made about Mauna, a term which he frequently used as a synonym for the self. I had understood some of Bhagavan's statements about Mauna, such as Mauna is the sadhana, for acquiring all kinds of spiritual wealth. But I was puzzled by his statements to the effect that silence is the equivalent of ceaseless speech and ceaseless work. Once as Bhagavan was returning from one of his walks, I told him about my doubts. Bhagavan says that to be still means to be ever active, and that to be silent means to be ever speaking. I don't understand how this can be so. Is that so? answered Bhagavan. Can you see that I am? Yes, I can see. How do you see? I confess that I did not know how it was seen. Just like that, to be still means to be ever working. Working does not mean working with a hole in one's hand. Working means to shine always as that, the self. Only silence is ever speaking. Moreover, both are the same. This is just what the great sages have expressed as I am remembering without forgetting. I am worshipping without becoming separate. I am thinking without thinking. I am telling without telling. I am listening without listening. And so on. If you don't speak, God will come and speak. The greatest scripture is the silent exposition. Only if you read this scripture will all doubt cease. Otherwise, even if you read chorus, Tens of millions of books countless times? Doubts will never cease. Bhagavan once gave a similar answer to a devotee who began by complaining. I do not know where this I is. Be where the I is. The following day the same man told Bhagavan, I do not know whether to go back to my village and do my work or just keep quiet. 
eating, bathing, going to the toilet, talking, thinking, and many other activities related to the body are all work. How is it that the performance of one particular act is alone work? To be still is to be always engaged in work. To be silent is to be always talking. One day, a woman who was a dedicated Congress party worker came to Sri Bhagavan for his darshan. After remaining in the hall for some time, she asked Bhagavan, Many great sages like you have toured around giving lectures, which pass on beneficial wisdom to the people of the world. You have attained jnana for yourself, but you sit in a corner keeping quiet. Of what benefit is this to the world? To know the self and to remain in that state of self is alone the greatest benefit a person can give to the world. All the lectures delivered from the stage will be effective for some people only, for as long as the person is on the platform. But the lecture of silence can always be heard all over the world. It will always be effective. The silence that Bhagavan was referring to was inner silence rather than outer silence. Bhagavan liked people to keep inner silence, but he generally disapproved if they asked his permission to keep outer silence as well. However, in my case, he seemed to approve. When I once informed Bhagavan that I had decided to observe Mauna from the next day onwards, he blessed me by saying, Aha, very good. But when he asked me, Why, where are you going? Are you not staying here? I replied, Even if I am here, some people of their own accord come to me to waste time and gossip. It is only because of this that I thought it would be good to take Maunavratam, a vow of silence. Bhagavan indicated that he was satisfied with my reply. Two days before this incident, I had tried to give Bhagavan some nungus, some palmyra fruits. I had stored them on Mr. Cohen's veranda in Palakotu because it was a convenient place to intercept Bhagavan on his daily walk. When Bhagavan came past, he looked at me suspiciously and asked me several times, Why have you come here? After some hesitation, I told Bhagavan, I came here to cut and give these nungus to Bhagavan. Bhagavan accepted the fruits, but as he was receiving them, he laughingly said, You should have eaten them yourself, and while you were eating them, you should have thought the thought. I am also Bhagavan. Bhagavan's reluctance to eat soon disappeared. He dug out many of the fruits with his fingers and sucked the juice. Finally, after exclaiming, Apadi, an expression of contentment, I cannot carry the stomach, he walked away. One evening, while I was accompanying Bhagavan on one of his walks, I asked him, When I meditate, my breath seems to get suspended in my stomach. Is this good? That is very good. Cheered by this positive comment, I ask him a further question. If I go on meditating after that, what will happen? Samadhi will be attained, replied Bhagavan. Does Samadhi mean that one is unaware of everything? No, meditation will go on without our effort. That is Samadhi. Then what is Sahaja Samadhi? In that state, meditation will always be going on. In that state, the thought, I am meditating or I am not meditating, will not occur. I then asked Bhagavan about periods in my meditation when I was only aware of an all-pervasive blankness. Sometimes nothing is seen. Is this good? Bhagavan did not seem to approve of these states. In the beginning, he said, it is good if meditators meditate with self-awareness. The state of Sahaja Samadhi continued to intrigue me. A few weeks later, I asked him another question about it. Can one practice Sahaja Samadhi right from the beginning? Bhagavan replied by saying that one could. But how to practice it, I asked, and how does one practice Nirvikalpa Samadhi? How many different kinds of Samadhi are there? There is only one kind of Samadhi, said Bhagavan. Not many kinds. To remain temporarily subsided in the reality, without any thought is nirvikalpa samadhi. Permanently abiding in the self without forgetting it is sahaja samadhi. Both will give the same happiness. Bhagavan once made the following remarks about the waking and dream states. The world vision which appears in the waking state 
and the world vision which appears in the dream state are both the same. There is not even a trace of a difference. The dream state happens merely to prove the unreality which we see in the waking state. This is one of the operations of God's grace. The world of the waking state changes in the same way as the world of the dream state. Both are equally insubstantial and equally unreal. Some people dispute this by saying, but the same world which we saw yesterday is existing today. Dream worlds are never the same from one night to the next. Therefore, how can we believe that the world of the waking state is unreal? History tells us that this world has existed for thousands of years. We take the evidence that this changing world has been existing for a long time and decide that this constitutes a proof that the world is real. This is an unjustified conclusion. The world is changing every minute. How? Our body is not the same as it was when we were young. A lamp which we light at night may seem to be the same in the morning, but all the oil in the flame has changed. Is this not so? Water flows in a river. If we see the river on two successive days, we say it is the same river. But it is not the same. The water has completely changed. The world is always changing. It is not permanent. But we exist unchanged in all the three states of waking, dreaming, and sleeping. Nobody can truthfully say, I did not exist during these three states. Therefore, we must conclude that this I is the permanent substance because everything else is in a state of perpetual flux. If you never forget this, this is liberation. Since this view of the world is so contrary to what we regard as common sense, Bhagavan was frequently questioned about it. Even his long-term devotees sometimes tried to get him to modify his views a little. I remember, for instance, one evening in the hall when Major Chadwick tried to persuade Bhagavan that the world did have some reality and permanence. If the world exists only when my mind exists, he began, when my mind subsides in meditation or sleep, does the outside world disappear also? I think not. If one considers the experiences of others who were aware of the world while I slept, one must conclude that the world existed then. Is it not more correct to say that the world got created and is ever existing in some huge collective mind? If this is true, how can one say that there is no world and that it is only a dream? Bhagavan refused to modify his position. The world does not say that it was created in the collective mind or that it was created in the individual mind. It only appears in your small mind. If your mind gets destroyed, there will be no world. To illustrate this truth, Bhagavan narrated a story. Long ago there was a man whose father had died thirty years before. One day he had a dream in which his father was alive. In the dream, the man who had the dream was a boy who had four younger brothers. His dream father had accumulated a great fortune, which he divided among the five brothers. The four younger brothers were not satisfied with their share. Out of jealousy, they came to fight with the eldest brother and began to beat him up. As he was receiving the beating in the dream, he woke up. On waking up, he very happily realized that he had neither a father nor any brothers. He discovered that of all the characters he had dreamt, he alone really existed. Similarly, if we go beyond this waking dream and see only our real self, we will discover that there is no world and that there are no other people. On the other hand, if we move away from the self and see the world, we find that we are in bondage. Bhagavan summarized these views a little later by saying, Every jiva, individual self, is seeing a separate world, but a jnani does not see anything other than himself. This is the state of truth. One day I asked Bhagavan, I often get stomach pains. What should I do about them? I was hoping that he would suggest some medicine. He replied, What to do about it? The body itself is a big disease. To destroy this disease, all we have to do is keep quiet. All other diseases will then leave even earlier. Then, as a joke, he remarked, You come and tell me about your diseases. Whom can I tell about the diseases that I have? 
Bhagavan never complained when he was ill. I remember one period when he suffered from piles for a long time without bothering to tell anyone. When the ailment was discovered, some devotees prepared some medicine and gave it to the Madhava Swami, telling him to give it to Bhagavan twice a day. Madhava Swami told Bhagavan that he must take this medicine, but Bhagavan refused, saying, Don't make any medicine for my sake and then give it to me. Taking medicine only increases the disease. As the donkey, the disease came, so it will go. Let me put up with it till it goes away. You need not make any recommendations. After that, he refused even to look at the medicine. Bhagavan finally said that he would take the medicine if all the devotees in the hall were given an equal share. Since we all wanted Bhagavan to get well, we all agreed to undergo the treatment collectively. Bhagavan often said that since there was no suffering in the self, all suffering must inevitably be a product of the mind. When I once asked him, is there no way to escape from the worldly suffering? He gave me a typical reply. The only remedy is to remain in the state of self without losing awareness of it. The problem of suffering was a popular topic of conversation in the hall since none of us, except for Bhagavan, was immune from the occasional bout of mental turmoil. The following questions and answers, which I jotted down at various times, contain a typical selection of Bhagavan's answers to devotees who wanted to understand or transcend suffering. Question. Bhagavan, all through my life, I have been experiencing nothing but suffering. Is it due to the sinful karma of my previous births? I once asked my mother whether I had been happy in her womb. She told me that she had suffered a great deal at that time. How is it that I have acquired so many sins? Why do I suffer so much? Bhagavan replied, We could say that it is due to purva karma, past karma, but instead of thinking that this purva karma is due to the karma of, for example, the incarnation previous to the last, find out to whom this present incarnation has come. If this body is what has taken birth, let it ask the question. You say that you are always experiencing suffering. That is only your thoughts. Happiness alone exists. What comes and goes is suffering. How is it that so much suffering comes to people who behave virtuously? It is good if suffering comes to devotees. The dobi, washerman, when washing clothes, beats them hard against a rock, but he does so only to remove the dirt from the clothes. Similarly, all sufferings are given for the sole purpose of purifying the mind of the devotee. If we are patient, happiness will follow. The next two questions were asked by me on different occasions. A happiness and suffering occur according to one's previous karma. If one has a desire for events to happen in a particular way, will they end that way? If a person has done a lot of punya, good deeds, in the past, right at this moment whatever he thinks will happen, but he will not be changing what is destined, whatever he desires will conform to what is to happen anyway. His desires will conform to that which was already determined by the desire or will of the Supreme. If there is plenty of papam, accumulated sense, the fruits of these acts will also materialize right now. The fruits of excessive punya and papam, which have been carried forward from past lives, will materialize in this birth. For Vidyaranya Swami, it rained gold. When one person does good deeds, suffering comes to him, but another person who does many bad deeds may not suffer at all. Why is this? Everyone is getting happiness and suffering as a result of the karma which has been carried forward from previous births. Accepting both patiently and remaining in the self, doing whatever actions one happens to be engaged in without seeking happiness or suffering from them, that alone is good. The inquiry, who am I, leads to the cessation of suffering and the acquisition of the supreme bliss. Question. I am trying to follow the path of virtue, but I am finding it impossible. My purva samskaras, previous mental habits, are preventing me. When will they disappear? Ask yourself, who am I? Your purva samskaras will disappear when you find out 
who has them. When I meditate, sleep overpowers me. I cannot avoid it. What should I do? If I say I awoke, it follows that I slept. When waking comes, we must be in the state that we were in when we were asleep. When sleep comes, we must awake. That is the state of awakened sleep. That is not possible for me. The greatest obstacle is the thought it is impossible for me. What to do when this thought catches hold of us and shakes us? The thought does not catch hold of us and shake us. The thought catching hold of us shakes itself. If this is so, how can I control the mind? Controlling the mind implies the need of a second mind to control the first. Trying to control the mind is like someone attempting the impossible task of measuring the length of his own shadow by himself. How were we in sleep? We are now the same, bodiless and mindless I that we were when we were asleep. Our first mistake is to leave that state and take the body to be I. Ajnana, ignorance must be destroyed, am I right? It will be sufficient if you investigate the one who has Ajnana, must be destroyed. Bhagavan, when I was living in Dirupaksha cave, many people used to come there with various kinds of snacks and meals. Many of the visitors would force me to eat big meals, which had many special items like vadai and payasam. One day I decided to fast so that I could give my stomach a complete rest. I knew that it was dangerous to stay at Virupaksha cave because visitors might turn up with food for me. So I went for a long walk through the forest on the southwest side of the hill. As I was walking through the middle of this forest, seven women followed me, each with a bundle on her head. When they saw me, I heard them speaking among themselves. The one who is walking ahead of us is our Swami. When they had satisfied themselves that I was the Swami, they came running towards me. One of them said, Swami, please sit down and take some of our food. One woman gave me idis, a second gave me muruku, a third gave me dosa, and so on. In this way, they competed with each other to serve me their various items. After eating and thinking, ah, what a good fast I had today, I started walking away from them. I had the idea of escaping from them, but the ladies called after me. Swami, you must be ready for our lunch at noon. We will not leave you. Then they walked away in the direction of the hill. Thinking that I must not get caught by them later in the day, I walked slowly for a short distance and then sat down at the foot of a tree to rest in the shade. At about twelve o'clock, the women came out of the forest and walked straight towards me. As they were approaching me, they insisted that I take them to a place where they could find drinking water. I took them to Sona Tirtam in the forest, thinking to myself, What a wonderful upavasam fast I am having today. When the women had finished drinking, they asked me to sit down and eat. A banana leaf was placed in front of me and dishes of all the six tastes, including rice, vegetables, sambar, rasam, vadai, and payasam, were served to me. I thought to myself, Oh, my Lord, what I ate this morning was sufficient for three days. How am I to eat all this? I felt as if I were being choked. Swami, one of the women inquired, Why are you looking like this? Eat as if you were all Unamalai, serving you. Thus the ladies gave me some Upadesa, spiritual teaching. As soon as I had finished eating, they started to leave, saying, Swami, since the day of our birth we never came to this forest before, but today we came here to pluck leaves. Suddenly they all vanished. Oh, these are tricky people, I thought, and continued my Pradakshina by walking slowly through the forest. Then, with the intention of going to Vitrilai Mandapam to sit down, I came out of the forest. Meanwhile, a devotee called Muramaswami Airer had bought two mangoes as big as pumpkins. He had made rasam out of the mangoes and brought it to Viru Paksha cave along with some rice which he had cooked. As I was not there, he inquired, Where is Swami? Hearing the people there say, Swami may have gone for Pradakshina of the hill. Swami will be going round the hill clockwise. I will go anti-clockwise, meet him, and give him this rasam and rice. 
Ramaswamy Ayer found me just as I came out of the forest. On seeing me, he immediately said, Swami, I went to Virupaksha cave to see you, but I couldn't find you. So I came here searching for you on the Pradakshina route. You must please take this mango, rasam, and rice. I told him all the incidents of the day, including how much I had eaten, but he would not listen to any of my excuses. He insisted that I must eat some of his food. I ate a little of it before saying, Enough, enough, today's punishment has been very good. Then I started to come back to Virupaksha cave, hardly able to walk. Bhagavan then went on to describe another incident which happened around 1903. One day Palani Swami, his attendant at that time, another man and myself were walking on the southern side of the hill along the bank of a brook. We saw an old lady breaking dry twigs for firewood at the top of a tree. I looked up to see who was collecting twigs for firewood at such a great height. Immediately the woman turned and looked at me. Stretching out both her hands, she gave me Upadesa. Hey you, may you be thrown on the funeral pyre. Why are you wandering all over the forest instead of sitting quietly in the place where you are? Mother, I replied, you are right. I am doing wrong. Wrong indeed. I will slap myself in punishment. As I was thinking about this matter, I turned to look up at the old woman, but she was not to be seen anywhere. Oh, she is another tricky lady, we concluded. Then after roaming all over the forest for a while, we came back to Virupaksha cave. When a visitor asked Bhagavan about Siddhi's supernatural powers, he replied, To remain unchanged in the state of self is the eternal Siddhi, the greatest of all Siddhis. All other Siddhis are only the Parabda of the Niyani who has realized the truth. These other Siddhis are trivial. This was very similar to an answer I had received myself a few weeks before. When I had asked Bhagavan about CDs, he had replied, Practicing of CDs will only fatten the ego still more. The greatest CD is not to see anything other than the self. All the CDs will come and wait upon the perfected jnani. On that occasion he had quoted Uladu Narpadu, verse 35. To realize the self which is always present and to remain as that is the real CD. All other CDs are like those which appear in a dream. Are they real when one awakes? Will those who have got rid of delusion and are established in their true state be deluded again? In November 1938, I went out onto the hill with Bhagavan. As we were coming back, I asked him, what must I do to avoid sleep during my meditation? Meditators must not work too much, nor should they fill their stomachs with excessive food. The more one fills the stomach, the lower one's mental state becomes. If the stomach is mostly empty, one will go higher spiritually. One should not tighten the strings of the vena either too much or too little. The body must be kept like that. Likewise with sleep, one-third of the night, has been allotted for sleep. That is, one must go to bed at 10 p.m. and wake up at 2 a.m. One should not sleep during the daytime. There is another system also. One should get up whenever one wakes up, and one should sleep whenever sleep comes. But one should not think, I slept or I woke up. Then he quoted verse 33 of Devi Kalutarva. The mind often strays in reveries or falls asleep. Be vigilant and turn it into its pristine state again and again. Someone once asked Bhagavan about the rupa and arupa, formless mind. Bhagavan answered by saying, Pure mind has the name manakasa, space mind or empty mind. Immediately on waking from sleep, a clarity of awareness, napti, arises without exception in all people. That is the formless mind. Thoughts such as, I am the body, this is the world, arise after that. This is the mind with form. In a cinema show, the light appears first. The forms appear on the screen only after that. Likewise, the light of the self comes first and provides the space for everything that follows. Another devotee wanted to know, what method should I use to make my mind steady and firm? Bhagavan told him, it is sufficient to think always of one thing. 
If the mind does not obey, again start thinking of only one thing. In the course of time, the mind will obey your orders. A third devotee asks about worldly activities. Sometimes there is meditation, at other times there are worldly activities. What is the difference between the two? Bhagavan answered, To be in meditation and to be in activity are both the same. It is like calling the same object by its name in two different languages. Like the crow, only having one eye but seeing in two different directions. Like the elephant, using the same trunk for the two activities of breathing and drinking water. Like the cobra, using its eyes for the two functions of seeing and hearing. Then he quoted the following verse from Kalvadya Navanitam. If you always remain aware that I am perfect consciousness, what does it matter how much you think or what you do? All this is unreal, like dream visions after waking. I am all bliss. The apparent dichotomy between meditation and worldly life prompted me to ask a question of my own. Bhagavan, I ask, how is it that one gets the same happiness from worldly activities that one gets from meditation? Bhagavan explained that contrasting emotions were all a product of the mind. One's happiness and suffering are dependent on one's mental state. Happiness is a natural state. Suffering occurs when one leaves the self and thinks that the body and the mind are I. What to do about this? The thought I am the body has been strengthened over many births. What remains after it has been destroyed is happiness. Bhagavan had not directly answered my question about the different types of happiness, but the matter was clarified later when another devotee asked a similar question. Bhagavan, the Shastras talk about so many different kinds of ananda, happiness or bliss. Are there really so many different types? No, replied Bhagavan. Ananda is only one. The ananda is itself God. Our natural state is ananda. Because this is experienced externally through various sensual enjoyments. Various names are given to it. However, many varieties of happiness are enjoyed. Many millions of varieties of misery will also have to be experienced. But this is not so for the Niani. He enjoys all the happiness enjoyed by everyone in the world as his own Brahmananda, bliss of Brahman. Brahmananda is like an ocean. The external types of happiness are like the waves, foam, bubbles, and ripples. Ananda is common to all in sleep. All living beings and all human beings from a pauper to an emperor experience ananda equally while they are asleep. Swami, as soon as I heard your name, I had a great desire to see you. I have now come. How did this great desire come to me? In just the same way that your body came to you. What is the fruit of one's life? If a person thinks that he must conduct himself according to the true principles of life, that itself is the fruit of great tapas done in his previous life. Those who do not think in this way are wasting their time. One evening, while we were all sitting on the hill, Bhagavan told us about two incidents which had happened at Virupanksha cave. In my early years, here I was once sitting on a rock on the hill when a boy came to see me. He was about eight years old. Seeing me, he said with great pity, Swami, why did you come away like this to live alone without any clothes? I gave him an answer which would satisfy his mind. The elders in my house became angry with me, so I left and came here. The boy asked, Swami, what do you do for your food? I replied, If somebody gives me some, I take it. Otherwise, I don't eat. The boy was shocked that I had to live such an arduous life. Ayo, he exclaimed, you come with me. I will talk to my boss and get you a job. If you work just for food for a few days, he will give you a salary later. I responded to his offer by remaining silent. On another day, as I was sitting on the bench at Viru Paksha cave, a small boy came up to me and stared at me for a long time. Then he cried and sobbed violently. Palanaswami, who was inside the cave, came out and asked him, Why are you crying? I feel great pity when I look at him, said the boy, and then he carried on sobbing. Sri Bhagavan, as he often did when he told stories, enlivened his narrative by acting out the parts of the people in the story. 
In this particular case, he gave a good imitation of the boy's words and sobs. Question. The Purunas say that moksha means living in Kailash, Vaikunta, or Brahmaloka, the Hindu heavens, and having darshan of God there. Is this correct? Or does moksha only come when one merges with Brahman in the state where there is no knowledge of the body, the world, and the mind? Bhagavan replied, Living in Vaikunta and Kailash is not moksha. If everyone goes to Kailash and Vaikunta, where will be space for everyone to live? If I must live and enjoy bliss with God, then God must be Jada, inert. If he is Jada, where can we enjoy bliss? Then Bhagavan quoted verse 31 of Uladunar Padu, which describes the real state of liberation. To one who has destroyed himself is ego and is awake to his nature as bliss. What remains to be accomplished? He does not see anything as being other than himself. Who can comprehend his state? Some people came from the south for Bhagavan's darshan. Among them was a small boy about five years old. He did namaskaram and then approached Bhagavan and looked at him lovingly. Bhagavan placed his left hand on the boy's head and asked him, What do you want? The boy replied firmly, I don't want anything. Oh, said Bhagavan, you belong to us. Then addressing the people he came with, he added, If he remains in the don't want state, everything will come to him. This reminded Bhagavan of an old incident from his own life. When I was staying at Pachaya Mam Temple, my loincloth got torn. I never made any request to anybody, so I had to stitch it myself. For a needle, I used a thorn from a cactus plant. I made a slit at the end which gripped a thread that I had removed from my loincloth. After the repairs were finished, I was able to wear it for another two months. During the same period, my towel had so many holes it looked like a net. One day a shepherd, after seeing this towel, tried to ridicule me by saying, Swami, the provincial governor, wants this towel. After washing and drying this towel, I used it to wrap around my hands so that no one could see what state it was in. Somehow, those who were with me came to know about it and brought three sets of new loincloths and towels. They took away my old towel and made me exchange my loincloth for a new one. If you remain in the don't want state, everything will come to you. That is why both likes and dislikes are not wanted. Maurice Friedman Sometimes when I meditate, I enter a state in which I don't know anything. Is this state Manolaya or Manonasa? In both Manolaya and Manonasa, questions will not arise. What is Manonasa? Remaining permanently as one is without the rising of any doubt or thought such as nothing is known or something is known alone is Manonasa. The scriptures say that attention should be placed at the center between the eyebrows. Is this correct? The feeling I am is directly evident to everyone. What happiness is there in seeing any particular God if one ignores this feeling? There is no foolishness like that of thinking that God exists only in certain spots such as the place between the eyebrows. Fixing the attention on these spots is just a violent form of sadhana whose aim is to concentrate the mind in order to prevent it from running everywhere. Inquiring who am I is a much easier method of controlling the mind. All the methods of religion are only good at certain levels of development. The maya created by the mind must be destroyed by the mind itself. What sort of food should a spiritual seeker eat? The niyama, rule of taking moderate amounts of sattvic food, is better than all other niyamas. Various kinds of asanas, yogic postures, are spoken of in the scriptures. What is the best, which must be practiced? Nidhyayasana, unwavering meditation or contemplation, is the best. It is enough if one practices this. At various times, I used to jot down brief answers or statements by Bhagavan, which for some reason or another inspired me at the time they were spoken. I usually omitted the question or the context of the answer, because at the time I didn't think that they were particularly relevant. The following list contains 12 such items. 
The flow of the river stops once it reaches the ocean and becomes one with the ocean. Likewise, if one's mind is always meditating on the self, eventually it becomes atmamayam, that is, it will be of the same nature as the self. When someone asked Bhagavan how to get rid of anger, he answered, Become angry with anger. Desires the root of anger. Desirelessness is absolute happiness. The natural name of every person is Mukti. He is a real man who does not let go his hold on the self-state while he is attending to whatever problems come of their own accord and without his desire. He who thinks I am the body is committing the sin of suicide. He who thinks I am Atman is a person of very great fortune. A moment of meditation on I am the Atman will destroy all Sanchita karma, just as the sun destroys darkness. How can karma remain undestroyed in the one who constantly meditates like this? When sleep comes, be awake. Sleep when you are awake. This is to sleep without sleeping. To be free from worries is to sleep without sleeping. Desire is maya. Desirelessness is God. The man who loves the all-supporting God with the understanding that nothing can be achieved by his own actions, and who expects instead that all actions will be performed by God alone, that man is led every minute by God along the path of truth. Everyone is seeing himself everywhere. One is in the same state that God and the world are in. Natural devotion is to know oneself and to remain permanently in that state without forgetting it. God is tinier than the atom and larger than the cosmos. All are forms of God. Because of our sense of difference, we think that we are an individual person. There is no mistake greater than this in the world. One can only think of spoiling others after one has spoiled oneself. Did God create the world in the beginning with as many differences as there are now? Or did these differences only come into being after some time? If God is common to everyone, why are some people good and some bad? One is lame and other is blind. One person is a jnani while many other people are ajnanis. Why did he create all these differences? Do the Ashtadik Palakas, the guardian spirits of the eight cardinal points, the thirty-three cores of devas, incarnate spirits, and the Maharishis, great seers, exist even today? Bhagavan replied after glancing at this paper of questions. The answer to all these three questions will shine forth of its own accord if you ask yourself, to whom did these questions occur? After knowing ourselves first, if we then look into the world created by God, we will understand the truth. To try to know God and the world without knowing oneself first is ignorance indeed. The opinions of a man who does not know himself are like those of a man suffering from jaundice, who tells other people that the color of everything is yellow. Who will agree with him? A small seed contains a big banyan tree. But which came first, the tree of the seed? What can one say in answer to this question? There is one real answer to such questions. If one knows oneself, there is no world. Bhagavan then supported this statement by quoting four lines from his own philosophical works. Is it not ignorance to know all else without knowing the self, which is the source of all knowledge? Can it be knowledge? If one has a form, the world and God will also have forms. What else is there to know for anyone when self itself is known? A little later, Bhagavan gave a similar answer to another devotee who wanted information about God and creation. Why did God, who is presumably free from all desires, create the world? There will be a place for this question only if this question exists apart from God. Why question about such things? Who is he who questions in the first place? Does this question exist while you are asleep? I am one, God is another. Who told you to think like this? 
Only when we know our own qualifications will we be able to know about God's. Is this not correct? First, find out who you are. What the self is and what God is can be learned later on. Because I have too much work to do, I keep forgetting to meditate. If I frequently forget this, when am I going to make any progress? Never mind. Jnana will not come in a day. Some scatters, mental habits will only go gradually. Today we may think every four hours, oh, I've forgotten to meditate. Tomorrow we may remember every three and a half hours. The day after, every three hours. In this way, enthusiasm for meditation will slowly come. Why do you think, why didn't I meditate or why didn't I work? If the thoughts I did and I didn't are given up, then all actions will end up as meditation. In that state, meditation cannot be given up. This is the state of Sahaja Samadhi. Have I done punya in my previous births? If not, how could these thoughts occur? The following questions were asked by a lady Congress party worker called Rameswari Nehru. What is Bhagavan's opinion about the entry of Harijans into temples? I have no separate opinion. All things are happening by the power of God. All things which need to be done are done by God at the proper time, in the proper place, and in the proper way. Is it good for one to do social service, or is it good for one to go in a cave and meditate instead? Both are good, but only he who has done service to himself knows how to serve society. A woman called Lady Bateman came to the ashram with her friends and retinue and stayed for a few days. She came for Dashan with her group and asked Bhagavan. Just as we do, Bhagavan eats, speaks, applies medicine for toothache, and so on. What then is the difference between us and Bhagavan? I can't see any difference. Bhagavan explained the difference between the Niyani and the Ajnani by giving several analogies. Just before going to sleep, a small boy started crying and asked his mother, Mother, I am hungry. Give me some rice. The mother replied, Please wait a little. The rice is still cooking. The boy fell asleep before the rice was ready. A little later, his mother woke him up and showed him the different types of rice that she had prepared. See, this is dal rice. This is razam rice. This is curd rice. The boy was very sleepy, but he still managed to eat before he fell asleep again. The next morning, as soon as he woke up, he asked his mother, Why didn't you give me any rice last night? All the people in the house knew that he had eaten, but the boy himself was not aware of it anymore because, for him, it had just been a sleepy interlude in the middle of the night. The activities of a niyani are in some ways similar to those of a small boy. That is, other people see him taking part in various activities, but the Nyani himself is not aware that he is doing anything. There are two other similar analogies. One can say that the state of the Nyani is like a man, listening to a story while his mind is elsewhere, or that he is like the sleeping driver of a bullock cart, whose cart continues to move down the road even though he is asleep. Let me give you another example. Two people were sleeping in the same place. One of them had a dream in which both of them suffered while they were wandering through many forests. The other person slept well without dreaming at all. The one who dreamed thought that the one who slept well was also suffering. The dreamer is like a Ajnani. He makes a dream world for himself, suffers in that dream, and because he is not able to see that it is only a dream, he believes that all the people in his dream are also suffering. The Nyani, on the other hand, does not dream a world at all. He invents no suffering, either for himself or for other people. That is because the Nyani looks upon everything as Nyana, as his own self, whereas the Ajnani only sees Ajnana around him. To what the Nani is asleep, to that the Ajnani is awake. To what the Ajnani is asleep, to that the Nyani is awake. Swami Rama Tirta was once doing japa of the name of Shiva on top of a high building. A man who was an Ajnani came up to him and said, Jump down from here, then we can find out whether this word you repeat can save you. 
Swami Ramatirtha ask him, Where is up and where is down? For the jnani who sees only jnana, such distinctions cannot exist. The ajnani is like the man who only looks at the names and forms that appear on the cinema screen. The jnani, on the other hand, is always aware of the screen on which the names and forms appear. In 1939, two Congress workers came into the hall and began to question Bhagavan. Can we attain jnana through your grace and teach it to the people of the world? First, know yourself. Leave it alone the idea of teaching others. If the world and its people remain, after realization, you may teach them. Trying to help the world without knowing yourself will be just like a blind man trying to treat the diseases in the eyes of others. First, clear your own eyes. If you do this, you will see the eyes of all others as your own. Then if you see the eyes of all others as your own, how can you exist without helping them? After reading the Mahavakya Aham Brasmani from the Vedanta Shastras, the Upanishads, any number of times, why is one unable to attain jnana? Knowledge of the self is not in the Vedanta Shastras. Knowledge of the self can only be obtained by studying oneself. How is one to study oneself? You can study it only if there are two selves, one which studies and the other which is studied. To remain as the self is to study the self. If you study the Vedas and the Shastras, you may get due respect in the world. Society will then decorate your neck with garlands, read you complimentary letters, give you good food, a great name, and much money. But all these things will be great obstacles for jnana and sadhana. However hard we try, the suffering due to samsara does not go away. If we see who is having the samsara, the suffering will go. It is said that one can attain the self by means of Pantanjali's yoga. Is this true? Yoga means the union of two existing things. Would you agree that there are two eyes? No. Where is one to attain knowledge of self? Since we ourselves are already the self, suffering arises only when we think, I am the body or there is a self which I have to attain. The self is not something that is a long way away. We need not search for it by traveling on planes or trains. To do this will be like a man who is immersed in water crying out, I am thirsty, I am thirsty. If we want to attain the self while already being the self, how is it possible? Please tell us a method to destroy the mind. Find out who has the mind. If the mind is still there after you succeed, you may then look for a method to destroy it. I have a mind. Who are you? Are you this body? Why do you not raise questions like this while you are asleep? Do you agree that the mind and the prana, the life force which animates the body, is not yourself? No, you are the self. If there is anything separate from you, you can think about doing good or bad things to it. But if you yourself are the only thing that exists, how can there be any likes or dislikes? Desirelessness is absolute bliss. We are asking you again because of our ignorance. We pray to Sri Bhagavan to forgive us and give us a reply. It is said that one must do spiritual practice, abhyasa, to get rid of the mind. How should this be done? Inquiring with the mind. Whose is the mind that ought to be destroyed? Is the aviasa to get rid of the mind? Who am I? I do not know. Without even knowing who you are, we want to attain something else. That which we want to attain is that which we already are. The experience of any state or heavenly world that comes to us will eventually go away again. That which comes and goes is not the self. That which is already within the experience of everyone, that alone is our real self. That is moksha. What benefit can the guru give to the disciple? Guru and God can only indicate the path by saying, You are that. Nothing else can be done. Walking along the path is the work of the disciple. I want to know myself. You must tell me the way. Do you agree that you have two eyes? 
That is what I do not know anything about. What should I do to make the mind calm down? It is sufficient to go on observing the place from where the mind arises. Once, while I was walking on the hill with Bhagavan, I asked him for a boon. Bhagavan, I do not want anything else in the world except the boon of not getting the I am the body idea. Nodding his head gently, Bhagavan graciously replied, All great people have toiled only for that. You are also that.